Thank you. Thanks, Brian, for that generous introduction. Thank you all for uh, your presence here this morning. Uh, it's a real privilege to be uh, with you. Uh, again, let me thank Brian for the invitation and, and the committee as well for making this happen and the Thiessen family as well. Uh, it's always nice to be back in Western Canada, a place now more than ever, having lived away from it for so long, uh, stirs up fond memories. Uh, and an inviting sense of the familiar and belonging, and I'll admit that my obsessions, as you'll soon hear, uh, about religion and politics, uh, religion and oil and politics, uh, partly grow out of my own experience in Western Canada, growing up on an oil patch in Alberta, Canada, where, incidentally, in the early 90s, or early 1980s, uh, growing up, uh, I heard a lot about another Trudeau, uh, Trudeau Sr., who, <laughs> as far as we were concerned, uh, was stealing our oil and uh, selling it for cheap to others. So, uh, very timely here today. But speaking of religion and place in less subjective terms, uh, I hope that my chosen topic for this lecture series will help us to think of innovative ways to assess the significance of a particular place, the oil patch, in America's long 20th century, and more generally to describe and reassess faith's role in long-standing struggles over energy and environment, land use and corporate power, and the foundations of our carbon democracy. Of course, as I've already alluded to, there is currency to this subject. The ferment has been stirred by very present day worries over matters like the Keystone Pipeline, during which energy politics have assumed an eschatological tenor. While Canadian politicians have promoted the Keystone as the savior for North American energy and security and a path to this continent's fiscal health, American politicians have engaged it in protracted debate. While Republicans have decried environmentalists for making the pipeline a religious issue and President Obama for succumbing to radical Jeremiah's, environmentalists and liberal Democrats have charged back with their own carbon-free gospel uh, and their own condemnations of Republican false faiths in a petrol-fueled corporate realm that is strangling God's world. So it is that one steel strand has triggered momentous political twists and turns and heated discourse about the transcendent significances uh, in and of terrestrial things. And this, of course, is only scratching at the surface of other displays of God and black gold's shared impact on drill sites in North Dakota and northern Alberta, fracking regions in Pennsylvania and Ontario, and oil-sensitive zones around the world. Needless to say, the politics of religion and oil, our topic for these two days, is current and morally charged and essential to our understanding of the immediate and past, uh, as well as the future of the United States, which will be my focus, but also of Canada. Let me just say that I welcome your commentary on current events as well as your pushback uh, in the Q&A. Uh, I think we should most definitely approach this powerful transnational nexus of petro faith and politics with a moral sensibility. After all, we are all implicated in our hydrocarbon age still affixed to its expectations and demands, and to fail to interrogate these absolutes really is to fail to anticipate and perhaps adjust their pull on us in the near future. Still, the main purpose of my talks is to approach God and black gold as a historian who is most interested in tracking the path that got us here to this moment when Americans and Canadians alike seem eager to reflect seriously on a resource with such extreme existential sway. With that in mind, I'd first like to offer a big picture sense of the project from which my talks are drawn. As we just heard, uh, my book in process right now is titled Anointed with God, God and Black Gold in America's Century. Uh, and it utilizes really a range of corporate and church records personal and political papers and local archives scattered across North America and abroad to chart America's enchantment with the black stuff. In a sense, I tell the religious biography of oil. At its highest altitude, this biography explores the ways that American power brokers and average citizens in the long 20th century imagined, articulated, and drew meaning and institutional power from oil's divine potentials and attached them to a faith and a politics of exceptionalism. 
I contend that the very concept of the American century itself, commonly used to describe uh, the nation's 100-year ascendancy through the 20th century, cannot be understood without paying heed to oil and religions arresting reciprocity. Now, to be sure, other natural resources have inspired sacred dreams of their own. Scholars, for instance, have suggested that 19th century coal was itself religious for the way it entwined matter and spirit in a modern manner, congealed meanings of progress into one enchanted material, and lent labor in the minds almost a sacrosanct feel. Yet I'd suggest that there was always something unique about oil's sacred status. For unlike coal, it spoke to the pristine and the new. Dirty, primitive, dug out of the earth, coal registered with Americans as a compromise next to petroleum, which ensured clean fuel for contemporary societies. Summoned, not scraped, from the earth in liquid form, democratic in essence for the way it privileged free labor and the individual's rule over the earth and its resources, Oil always seemed the pure industrial lifeblood that could guarantee humanity's march into an advanced modernity. Let's make sure this is gone here. Is it going? All right, one more. There we go, thank you. This, again, special sense of oil as a pure industrial lifeblood uh, was abundantly popular, or abundantly evident, rather, in popular literature at the turn of the 20th century, uh, which sparkled with predictions of American oil's manifest destiny and offered generous religious allegory of American dominance in a modern world order. Writing in 1900, one chronicler stressed this point in almost scriptural verse. Everywhere, American oil is to be met with in the Orient, in the hovel of the Russian peasant, in the harem of the Turkish pasha. It lights the temples and the mosques amid the ruins of Babylon and Nineveh. It is the light of Abraham's birthplace and, the, uh, and of the hoary city of Damascus. It burns in the grotto of the Nativity at Bethlehem, in the church of the Holy Sepulchre at Jerusalem, on the Acropolis of Athens in the plains of Troy, and in the cottage and palace along the banks of the Bosphorus, the Euphrates, and the Golden Horn. It has penetrated China and Japan, reached the wilds of Australia, and shed its radiance over many a dark African waste. American petroleum is the true cosmopolite, om omnipresent and omnipotent in fulfilling its grand mission of enlightening the whole universe. Moving. Let's try this. There we go. As much as US oil was mythologized in these biblical abstractions, it also directly influenced God-fearing individuals with clout, who in turn translated crude and Christianity's vision of the future into real institutional structures, policies, and outcomes of significance on a global scale. Consider, for instance, Henry Luce, in February of 1941, the missionary son turned publishing mogul used the pages of his life magazine to beseech Americans to recognize their status as protector of the free world and create the first great American century. Unbeknownst to his readers is that Luce tested his charge a month earlier in an address to the American Petroleum Institute. There he pressed uh, or praised oilmen for being the vanguards of America's manifest destiny. Having within you a dynamic spirit of freedom and enterprise and a genius for cooperation and organization, it follows inevitably that you do not stop at the frontier of mountains or sea or jungle, nor at the man-made frontiers of knowledge or tradition or hope. For your sense of the illimitable roundness of the world, I salute you. For Luce, petroleum struck something unusual in the soul, a sense of limitless power which, when harnessed by God-fearing patriots held the capacity to transform the world into something godlier and good. America's special blessing, oil was in his mind also its peculiar burden, its prophetic charge. 
Luce drew on metaphor to encourage his compatriots to use oil to illumine and fuel international advancement with America at the head. Scholars have proved how the United States' hegemony in oil served as a pillar of the American century. For Luce, the very architect of the term, suggests that a religion of international uh, outreach and authority uh, be seen and included as its twin column. Luce's sense of vocation spoke to the uh, aspirations of a whole cadre of visionaries who believed that a petroleum-fueled Protestantism, big religion, ecumenical, internationalist, cosmopolitan, wedded to big oil, defined by integration, combination, and collective effort between state and company in foreign fields, could guarantee this nation's post-war global influence. Even as they spoke this doctrine, the most important players in the game, the Rockefellers and Standard Oil, were translating it into a blueprint for international exchange in hopes of ushering humanity into a new age. Witness the flurry of their activities in the 1940s, at a time when the scientific advancement of the oil industry seemed to preclude religious confidences and replace oil's earlier sacred ambitions with a secular outlook. Consider, for instance, in the realm of philanthropy, where John D. Rockefeller's uh, charitable endeavors uh, reached into uh, a system of ecumenical internationalism uh, and helped fund the Federal Council of Churches and even support the United Nations. Or in the realm of public relations, where we see The Lamp, a magazine produced by Standard to keep employees and stockholders informed and inspired to advance petroleum's humanitarianism into societies of all race, ethnicity, and stages of development. Or on drilling platforms in the 1940s in places like uh, Standards Camps in Saudi Arabia, where Southern Baptist technicians from Texas trained their Muslim mentees how to engineer a better world for humanity through oil. Or in these camps' community life, as Arab elders shared their wisdom of the world with earnest American Boy Scouts and as workers as a whole turned their local environs into vital repositories of scientific inquiry, religious envisioning, and their combination for the cause of petroleum's fantastic destiny for the better and the new. But this civil religion of crude, as I call it, is just one facet of the United States' oil's uh, religious biography. When we cut to a lower altitude, in fact, we find another narrative thread, one running in tension with Luce and the Rockefellers, and stemming from citizens of a different sort, those who resisted Big Oil's ecumenical pull, who held far less power than the Rockefellers but dreamed about petroleum in similarly sweeping terms, and who used their access to oil to carve out a new political path for their churches, communities, and country. Theirs was not an abstract assurance of oil's goodness, but a hard, fast dogma of oil's purity and might. Indeed, as much as we can appreciate oil's sacred meaning to all those who chased it and measure its totalizing hold over the American soul, we must also understand the marriage of God and black gold as the product of a particular environment and the place-specific faith and politics that grew up there. As Thomas Tweed has theorized, religion itself must be defined in spatial and geographical terms, recognizing also the currents that keep these terms always in flux and situational. Religions are, in this sense, sacro spaces. As he quotes, as he writes, confluences of organic cultural flows that intensify joy and confront suffering by drawing on human and superhuman forces to make homes and to cross boundaries, and that tie terrestrial terrains to the cosmos. The sacro space that interests me then is the oil patch, a landscape cohered around particular notions of God and black gold as omnipotent. There, amid jungles of derricks and the smells, sounds, and glow of refining fires, countless citizens stirred up with spiritual ardor by the prospects of crude interpreted petroleum as their special providence, as God's special gift to them, to be used to advance a kingdom of their making. Citizens such as oil hunters like William Cummins, a Southern Methodist minister pictured here who 
one day decided to chase oil instead of souls, and in the process discovered Mexico's first oil fields. Or Oklahoma townswomen who joined geological societies to make sense of their land's subsurface wealth. Or independent oil companies like Sunoco, which boasted a muscular free market brand of oil against standard and the major's monopolistic ways. These and other residents of the oil patch advanced a carbon gospel of their own, which I call wildcat Christianity. Awakened at the turn of the 20th century by the entrepreneurial ambition and utopian expectation that accompanied the rank and file's pursuits of oil, wildcat Christianity offered them meaning and purpose and authority amid the boom-bust cycles of speculative capitalism and the jarring fluctuations of wealth, health, and time that in inevitably followed. It did so by blending a theology of personal encounter with scripture, soil, and an active and all-powerful God with a politics of possessive individualism and small-scale association that in their minds best suited the manifold disruptions of life in the modern hydrocarbon age. Such belief in their custodianship of oil led to their strong actions on its behalf, and all North Americans have felt the effects. So for the remainder of this morning, I'd like to introduce you to the American oil patch uh, and its nurturing of wildcat Christianity. Uh, and as you will soon see, this entity that I've deemed wildcat Christianity resembles evangelical in its composition. Uh, its theological emphases highlighted by the individual's authority before God, its social outlooks hi highlighted by its strong emphases on local autonomy, institutional composition, underscored by its dominant Presbyterian, Baptist, and Pentecostal structures, and its politics, highlighted by its, highlighted by its radical egalitarianism, all bear the mark of evangelical influences. Yet wildcat Christianity is conceptually more inclusive, more expansive than the term evangelicalism allows. Catholics, too, were caught up in the spirit of this faith and its imperatives were products of a remarkably ecumenical encounter with material and immaterial dimensions of life in a way that the term evangelical elides. Wildcat Christianity, one could say again, borrowing from Tom Tweed, is a cosmology of organic cultural flows that tie specific terrestrial terrains and the people that inhabit them to the mysteries, the hope, and expectations of a universe beyond. So after providing just a snapshot of wild, wildcat Christianity's first frontiers, I'll highlight some of its lingering effects, uh, and then, depending on time, also conclude with just a brief illustration of wildcat Christianity's emerging power in the United States uh, and its imp impact on the society's evolving struggles over land, labor, capital, and the modern condition. Now that I figured out that I had this the wrong way, let's proceed. <laughs> The oil patch of which I speak was always in motion, one on the move, shifting across the continent uh, and then ultimately across the ocean. Our history of wildcat Christianity is, in other words, a story of migration and ceaseless drive toward the next big boom. The early, uh, early 20th century reformer Ida Tarbell, whose father was a wildcatter, aptly described the oil patch as an imagined destination as much as an actual place to which ambitious men moved briskly. Of their wonderlust, she wrote, fortune was running fleet-footed across the, across the country, and at her garment men clutched. They loved the chase almost as much as they did the success. Now the results of their labor, those chasing the booms, were places that did in fact acquire concreteness. Uh, just to give you again a brief outline of this migratory uh, nature of oil, it, the story of oil in America, of course, begins in Titusville, Pennsylvania, western Pennsylvania. There in 1859, a gentleman by the name of Colonel Drake drilled first commercially, the first commercially successful well in western Pennsylvania. Uh, the business would grow quickly during the Civil War, but especially uh, in the generation that followed the Civil War. Now, some will contest that oil was first discovered for these purposes right here in Canada, in Petrolia, Ontario. Uh, where there was a find by James Miller Williams in 1858, which in its own right set off a boom in Ontario that would continue through the late 19th century. 
From Titusville in Pennsylvania, oil moved west over the Mississippi, making its most pronounced and important uh, shift to the landscape uh, of petroleum and the politics that would follow, first to Southern California in the 1890s, or early 1900s, and then beginning literally in January of 1901, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, oil is struck in Spindletop in Southeast Texas, uh, setting off a 50-year at least mark, uh, a 50-year period that would become known as the Gusher Age. Uh, all of which put Texas really at the center of international crude uh, for the first half of the 20th century and ultimately for the entire, entire century itself. These strikes uh, unfolding with increasing intensity shaped America's capitalist and religious landscapes in profound ways at a time when the nation was just entering the modern era. Both transformations were dictated by a rule of capture that governed American oil, and in a way, the evangelical sympathies of the oil patch. This rule of capture was the distinctive legal code that outlined mineral rights in the United States, granting full authority to any individual who tapped subsurface crude. This code allowed oil hunters to take as much oil as they wished from wells, even if it meant draining the pool under a neighbor's property. By this reasoning, oil belonged to the individual who captured it. What this meant in vocational terms was simple. It was best to drill quickly before someone drained the pool under your property. What this meant in effect was equally simple, unfettered exploitation and feast or famine trends. Now for John D. Rockefeller, the devout Baptist and founder of Standard Oil, the chaos engendered by the rule of capture was wasteful and counter to his view of capitalism, which in his mind necessitated order. His was a bureaucratic outlook that lined up with Max Weber's Protestant work ethic, which assumed that good Christian capitalists would always promote logics of efficiency, calculation, and control. And so he designed a system of consolidating resources, stamping out competition, and imposing his order on the business. And as you know, standard would come uh, to uh, represent the ultimate monopoly in early 20th century America. Whereas Rockefeller sought control by dulling the radical edges of his industry and church, his small competitors saw in their rule of capture the virtues of a pristine capitalism. Despite the Darwinian excesses that it encouraged, they considered this principle sacrosanct. For these wildcatters, who earned their title by drilling wildcat discovery wells on untapped land, the rule measured up with their longings for personal authority and wishes to act alone. Theirs was a mandate forged out of a particular land use principle, attachment to a resource with seemingly mystical properties, and a tantalizing promise of fortune worth any cost. Again, witness those who harbored and extended the wildcat imperative and blended it with a radical faith. Patillo Higgins, uh, the gentleman here uh, pictured before you uh, in the bottom left, a one-armed Bible-toting wildcatter uh, who claimed direct access to the divine. I was the best Bible scholar in the whole country, he boasted. If I read anything in the Bible, I know just what it means. He was quite literally in his estimation an apostle. And it was his initiative, his vision of oil as occupying space west of the Mississippi, something that Standard and the Rockefellers did not believe actually existed, that led to the Spindletop discovery of January 1901. And also, there's companies of independent, run by independent oilmen like Sunoco, uh, started by Joseph Newton Pugh, uh, a wildcatter born in western Pennsylvania who would make his start in oil in the 1870s and 1880s and weather the storm of the Rockefeller machine uh, before seeing the company uh, grow in success after the Spindletop discovery. You will learn more about Sunoco in uh, the next lecture. Pew's striving after profit in the face of stiff odds was a widely accepted mode of operation that lent oil's first frontier ventures a sacred feel. Swept up in the chase for subsurface minerals and lost souls, uh, Sunoco, Higgins, and their peers reveled in the risk-taking of their work and pursued the make-it-big potentials of petro petroleum with fierce assurance that they were doing God's work. Indeed, unlike the Protestant ethic that Weber 
and Rockefeller surmised, which prioritized the rational and bureaucratic, Pew's fellow wildcatters accepted the volatilities of chance and pursued extravagant profits and gave just as extravagantly as if there were no tomorrow. They were warrior heroes, the label Weber applied to a class of capitalists he saw as antithetical to a true spirit of capitalism. The sustained labor of these wildcatters, something we'll track further in the next few hours, suggests that they were a rule, not an exception, and that there may in fact be more than one Protestant work ethic, more than one spirit of capitalism. Whatever drove them forward, it was a spirit that was boundless in geographical reach. These were no parochial be beings stuck in a local, insulated, or reactive mode. Their sense of manifest destiny, of doing God's work, was a transcontinental curiosity, and by the 20th century, a requisite of global reciprocity. Consider oil hunters like John Hunter, or John Carter, while exploring the North American West, then Japan, Carter mapped his own spiritual journey in diary entries. These entries reveal a man who championed oil and the rule of capture as an essential force for American capitalism's progress. His, at least initially, was a drive for conquest. But as his sojourning expanded and as he learned more about the languages and peoples of distant lands, his quest also became multidimensional and benevolent. Eventually, he came to see oil as a means by which a fallen humanity could realize its better self through careful application of Earth's resources in civilization-building enterprises. And oil was, in fact, his first step to ecological thinking, to a deeper understanding of a god whose goodness was imprinted on the land. Carter's experience was replicated many times over by oil hunters who crisscrossed the globe from multiple directions considered Edward Winnett, uh, pictured on the left, uh, a driller from Petrolia, Ontario, who joined hundreds of his townsmen abroad. Petrolia oilers were known for developing the pole to method of drilling, uh, which was useful in a rocky and unreasonable or unreadable field. In high demand, they were recruited during the late 19th, early 20th centuries to Indonesia and Peru, Turkey and Romania, Egypt and Galicia, and points in between. Winnett and those who joined him in journeying to these foreign locales <clears throat> thought that North American know-how in God and petroleum was something to be aggressively sold to the rest of the world. They did their best to act out their vocations with the single-mindedness of the missionary and assurance of empire builders. Yet as much as they resisted acknowledging it, their views of the world were softened and changed by their adventures and the dialectics of transnational exchange that they precipitated. Prospecting for petroleum became their exercise in knowing God and the world and letting both talk back to them. Led by generations of oil hunters in Carter and Winnett's mold, the spirit of oil outreach thus folded into a movement with international momentum. Yet what was life like on the oil patches that they created then left behind? What social and cultural dynamics did wildcat Christianity exude on those patches of extraction? I'd like to just briefly highlight four features, I think, uh, that stand out uh, with lingering import, uh, features of life on these terrains. Uh, and I will do so by referring to one oil patch in particular, that which grew up in uh, the Depression era uh, East Texas. Uh, in 1930 and 31 amid woods, of, rural, of four rural, undeveloped East Texas counties, uh, wildcatters discovered the largest oil pool in the world, some 43 miles long and roughly 10 miles wide, estimated to contain 5.5 billion barrels. You see a map here uh, pointing uh, to the northeast corner of Texas. Uh, as you can imagine, this is under, uh, this is taking place in the middle of the depression, in the poorest region of the country, yet instantaneously, uh, uh, just as the decade is beginning, oil is discovered in this poor region of the country, to which, as you can imagine, also flocks uh, thousands and thousands of workers and citizens looking for uh, some subsistence in their time of need. More jobs, higher incomes, and prospering heartland towns. This was the odd yet happy circumstance that made East Texas an island during America's decade of depression. 
The phenomenal excesses of abundance led, lent it a larger than life feel. Americans burdened with doubts of their future watched these developments with morbid curiosity. Was East Texas a dreamland or a dystopia? The excesses of, excesses of East Texas, which intensified as the boom played out, uh, is in part what made it utterly transformative for wildcat Christianity and for those who now lived under its grip. Quoting scripture, East Texans pointed to Moses' blessing of the tribe of Asher. Asher is most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers and let him dip his foot in oil. Certain that this biblical truth was theirs now to live, they embedded their pursuit for crude in Old Testament tales of chosenness, baptized their labor in New Testament narratives of God's blessing and grace, and assumed an end times thinking that lent urgency to their calls to drill. Having dipped their feet in oil, East Texans in the 1930s fashioned themselves as Israel's remnant and America's future. Their work in the pews, the fields, and in politics soon came to bear the marks of this mythology as well as of the difficult realities they tried to gloss over. Enraptured with the black stuff, East Texans uh, revamped a system of belief, association, work, and lobbying that could legitimate their custodianship of crude. What was the first feature that I'd like to highlight here? Well, first, amid the excitement of this gusher age, many intensified a spiritual outlook that saw God as the reason for their escape from affliction into a fresh reality of empowerment. Even as they envisioned this providential force, they also embraced the mysteries and curious workings of chance. And in keeping with a Pentecostal ethic, I use that term uh, in, uh, with a small letter uh, P, a small P, uh, celebrated the speculative and supernatural dimensions of faith, oil, and the market. Good Christians, they believed, were to spend more energy riding and maximizing the whims of oil than trying to control and discipline them. Theirs, in other words, was a millennialist, a millennialist view of capitalism, which in alignment with the wildcatters mentality, the warrior heroes uh, who did so much to carve out their sacro space, rejected any concepts of stockpiling and instead stressed the need to make and spend money quickly before time ran out and Christ returned. And again, the images of this booming landscape uh, show us why this mindset might have been reinforced. Poor farms becoming modern jungles overnight. Uh, Sundays uh, after church spent picnicking in front of derricks, uh, waiting for those derricks to blow. Uh, and then, uh, again, uh, evidences of abundance all around them, uh, including around their churches. East Texans also pondered the metaphysics of their new condition in the context of uh, spectacular institutional growth. The linkage was obvious. Uh, there was uh, certainly uh, incredible growth at this time. Uh, congregations like uh, this one pictured below, uh, Spring Hill Church lot in Longview, uh, once occupying a shack, uh, was able to use the uh, money that came out of their drilling to build a large Gothic-style cathedral. Gothic-style cathedrals, in fact, became all the rage in 1930s East Texas. So anomalous in America's Depression era, well-financed ministries nevertheless became the expectation for East Texas's congregations. A democratic promise, again, as we see uh, church growth uh, uh, allowed uh, all Baptists and Pentecostal and Catholic churches in East Texas uh, to uh, really uh, empower their ministries, uh, ministries that would go state and national wide in influence. The windfall for East Texas lucky citizens also created a second effect, therefore, a leveling of class and a rising conviction that plain folk could finally realize their destiny as equals. As one writer offered, here was a democratic opportunity that pushed social and economic frontiers far beyond Adam Smith's wildest dreams. Local demographics suggested the impact uh, of this democratic promise, uh, again through stunning growth patterns in the area's most modest religious organizations. Oil saturated with riches pouring into their offering plates, especially the most marginalized religious folk attending poor capital P Pentecostal parishes could enjoy the launch to a new social order. Now being able to escape 
If partially, the harshest burdens of Jim Crow racism merely intensified petroleum salvific experience. This was an experience that black churches pursued with particular inner earnestness. In the same manner as their white counterparts, they drilled for oil on their church properties in order to generate funds for their ministry. Black evangelicals from all denominations targeted East Texas, cognizant of its emerging importance to the uplift of the black church. White newspapers, like the Dallas Morning News, were quick to identify church-going African Americans' riches as signs of their society's health and as a way to glance over its vilest bigotries. In his account of oil-rich African Americans in East Texas, one newspaper man made a point of noting that, quote, luck was with the Negroes, too. Skewed, there nevertheless was some truth in the claim. Caught up in oil fever and a gospel of prosperity that it engendered, African Americans saw their hunt for crude as the endeavor that would finally break them free. To be sure, their racial plight would remain largely intact, the racial violence of East Texas itself unabated. Still, East Texas was also home to enough illustration of black capitalist verve that suggested booming oil could be a racial solvent as well. And here, uh, the image of Jake Simmons opens up a history of uh, black evangelical capitalists who use their wealth from oil to uplift their local communities uh, and to engender again a certain prosperity gospel uh, that would emerge in the post-World War II period. Simmons on his, uh, uh, on his own would also uh, open up in the 1950s and 60s uh, oil exploration in Nigeria, quite literally uh, linking uh, Africa with uh, his African American community in Oklahoma and Texas. Bolstered by the success of their communities, looking to future gains, East Texas church folk nevertheless knew intuitively that oil wasn't permanent. Writing in 1933, one local captured this sentiment when he titled his memoir, Where Oil Flows, Joy and Woe Curiously Mingle. Showers of wealth and health today could mean deluges of misfortune tomorrow. This was the trade-off of life in an oil dreamscape, where the temporality and frailty of everything and an inevitable future of depletion always weighed heavily on the soul. When you strike oil, another local admitted, you let loose Hades. Hades was apparent in various forms during the 1930s, with some familiarity to those who had witnessed booming oil communities before, but also with some strangeness. Uh, moral concerns, one form of evidence of boom bus culture. Mud, desecration of community aesthetics. A world of steel machinery, throbbing of engines, horizons aglow with fire. All of these evidences, again, of this dangerous trade-off. But for many East Texans, the trade-offs of their boom necessitated more than mere survival. It also generated new eschatological thinking. Blessed by God with oil, they shoulder, shouldered a sense of responsibility to use it for kingdom-building objectives before their dispensation suddenly ended. Theirs was a tenuous existence that encouraged them to assign cosmic purpose to their earthly pursuits to appreciate life's surprising bursts of health and wealth as a miraculous interlude to an otherwise difficult slide toward cataclysmic end, and to pray to an all-powerful being who giveth and taketh suddenly, but who is always there. Two mid-decade developments uh, in the 1930s in East Texas helped reify uh, local residents' eschatological sense. The first, I think, uh, instructive is the rise of premillennialist thinking in Texas at this time, generated very much by uh, pastors uh, with roots in East Texas. A second pictured here on the right is the New London School explosion of March 1937, which wiped out 300 uh, students, uh, half of the underage population in a small oil town in East Texas. A young reporter, Walter Cronkite, on his first mission was traumatized by uh, seeing this event, uh, being seeing the aftermath of this event. Quote, I did nothing in my studies nor my life to prepare me for a story of the magnitude of the New London tragedy, nor has any story since, he would later write, uh, equaled it. As Cronkite saw, East Texans now lived an end times exist existence, where hellacious reversals of fortune, not easy progression towards utopian ends were the norm. But there was also an active side to this eschatology. 
Rather than dwell on their despair, local pastors charged, citizens needed to renew their faith in a Christ who expected them to use whatever prosperity they had in their passing moment to prepare the world for his return. Fourth and finally, for all of its destructive potentials, technology itself also served as a friend to oil patch residents and, wild, and the wildcat ethic. Through their Pentecostal ethic of capitalism, an eschatology of crisis, and a democratic promise, wildcatting citizens absorbed yet a fourth essential truth, that they represented a last glimmer of hope for humanity, that they alone had the courage to stare down end times darkness with uncompromising drive. If time is running out, Christ's return on the horizon, what is any God-fearing person to do but drill, drill, drill? And if drilling was such an urgent imperative, the question was how to best accomplish the task. A place where the mysteries of oil and God were embraced as a natural order, the oil patch thus also became a site where the applied sciences of extraction were tested and advanced and carried out by people with purpose. To be sure, oil hunting did not embrace the newest extraction techniques readily or quickly. Well into the 20th century, in fact, many oilers continued to rely on charismatic techniques as they were known for hunting crude. This included smell and touch and spiritualist devices like divining rods. Yet increasingly, most of the oil patches, serious practitioners approached their manifest destiny as technocrats who with Bibles, topographical surveys, and mechanical know-how in hand, sought to maximize modern logics for profit. They took the lead in mapping frontier landscapes, employed geological methods, and designed machinery to extract and manufacture crude. They sorted through science in order uh, to find its best applications and the best answers to their environs. In this way, they also aligned sacred and scientific epistemologies of their technological age. Wildcat Christianity indeed flourished because of its engineering values and ability to nurture its sense of cultural and political authority through emphases on the taxonomic reading of text, time, and market dynamics. Hardly anti-intellectual, anti-modernist bumpkins, oil patch citizens were rather cutting edge moderns in their own way. And young and old, men and women, churches and community absorbed that sensibility. As we look ahead to the mid and late 20th century topics of interest for our next two lectures, we'll see how this cosmology of crude that emanated from the oil patch would shape American religion and politics in lasting ways. I'd like to close just very brief, briefly with a, a snapshot from this period, however, uh, the period that we've glanced over today, as illustration of how wildcat Christianity was already showing itself to be a formidable force one determined to shift the balance of power in America's pulpits, pews, uh, petroleum sector, and in politics. The snapshot comes from the life of Lyman Stewart. How many of you recognize that name? Some of you perhaps who have read uh, recently in class. Uh, Lyman Stewart, a man who along with his brother Milton started Union Oil Company. He is, as you might also know, the man who funded the Fundamentals, a series of articles published in the 19-teens in opposition to liberal Protestantism. This publication would become a reference point for the fundamentalist movement that would emerge in the years that followed. Now, who was Stuart? What drove him? Like the Pews, like the Wildcatters that I've highlighted, highlighted briefly today, he was born in Western Pennsylvania in 1840, went to discover oil for himself in Titusville in 1859, spent the 1860s and 1870s there, uh, but saw his business almost stamped out entirely by Rockefeller and Standard Oil. So he moved west, uh, and with the help of his brother and investors from his Presbyterian church in Pennsylvania, he started Union Oil Company in California known for being puritanical in his company policies. Uh, he, uh, his company towns were uh, known for being very strict morally. Uh, he nevertheless was quite uh, generous and almost radical in his willingness to speculate and take chances with his business, and even do so when his company was in jeopardy of failing altogether. Indeed, Stuart was truly a wildcat Christian with firm commitment to a millennialist capitalism that shunned as he sought the coercive, slow-moving, and secular mechanisms of Rockefeller's work. Stewart indeed fought the Rockefellers at each turn during the early 20th century, a time when, thanks to his company's growth in California 
in the early 20th century, he was able to fight back. And political consequences would soon follow. Stewart, in fact, would supply Ida Tarbell, uh, the muckraking journalist, with some of the information she would use to help take down Standard Oil in 1911. But Stewart's true aspirations were to upset Rockefeller control of the religious realm. All of his corporate ambitions stemmed from a desire rooted in his youth to fund fundamental Christianity, to use oil as a means to advance missionaries, churches, and education. His was a philosophy that said he had to earn quickly, spend quickly, and prepare the world for Christ's return. Stuart proved proficient in the construction of religious institutional structures that held to this belief. Here at home uh, on North American soil, of course, he was most famous for funding uh, Los Angeles' Church of the Open Door, which was the Moody Tabernacle of the West Coast, and also Biola, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. All of these ministries were outlets for Stuart to shore up the orthodoxies of his faith, the orthodoxies of his rule of capture. In rejection of the Rockefeller empire and its extended reach into American Christianity, Stuart held high the essence of a faith in which the individual maintained direct access to the divine through literal interpretation of an inerrant Bible, the upholding of traditional moral values, and the belief in an all-powerful act of God. And this imperative had international dimensions, much of them based on the contest between Union oil and Standard Oil between conservative and liberal Protestants in China. There in the 1920s, an epic battle, which church historians refer to as a key break between fundamentalists and modernists, transpired in a wider context of petroleum politics. It happened at Kuling, China, where Stuart supported missionaries, many of them Canadians, faced off against their brethren, many associated with Rockefeller-sponsored agencies. Now, John D. Rockefeller Jr. helped precipitate the clash. Frustrated with what he considered outmoded strategies of corporate and Christian outreach, which seemed unable to meet China's needs, he decided to build a modern philanthropy that could channel standard profits into a scientifically informed, rational system of global development. Gone were the individualistic, salvific, and supernatural emphases of the wildcatter's faith. Arrived were the liberal internationalist ideas of the progressive cosmopolitan. Rockefeller's turn held, uh, held profound implications for his company's agenda, but it also altered the course of U.S. Protestantism. Working with Reverends Frederick Gates and Raymond Fosdick, Jr. made the Rockefeller Foundation an unassailable force in the modernist wing of Protestantism, and modernist Protestantism itself an ascendant force in U.S. religion. Independent oil's fundamentalists fought back. Conservative missionaries sponsored by Stuart agitated against the Rockefeller agenda and reasserted the familiar emphases of their wildcatters' faith. Through journals and pulpits back in North America, they made it clear that Rockefeller's secularizing brands of business and church were doing great damage. In Kuling, meanwhile, where missionaries gathered for summer retreats high in the cool mountains, theological battles raged between the warring sides with unprecedented ferocity. Even though they were outnumbered, Stewart's missionaries managed to raise the stakes of this struggle for the soul of American Christianity. Would traditional faith prevail, or would Rockefeller's ambitions hold sway? After witnessing these clashes firsthand during one of their Asian tours, uh, facilitated by Standard Oil, Rockefeller and Fosdick returned to the United States disillusioned. Fosdick followed up by delivering a sermon that rocked the Protestant world, titled, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? He used his homily to distinguish between the, quote, intellectually hospitable, open-minded, liberty-loving, tolerant people who followed his creed and the intolerant fundamentalists who traded in tiddlywinks and picadellos of religion. In answer to his homily's question, he emphatically declared that fundamentalists would not win the war because, uh, and should not win the war, because right thinking and a generous spirit promised to prevail. Meant to inspire tolerance, Fosdick's homily instead exacerbated hostilities. If ever a sermon failed to achieve its objective, he would later admit, mine did. It was a plea for goodwill, but what came of it was an explosion of ill will, making headline news of a controversy that went the limit of truculence. His words also lacked foresight. As battles over God and black gold continued to heat up in the 1920s and 30s and then the 1940s, it quickly became apparent that those Fosdick and Rockefeller deemed fundamentalists had plenty of fight left in them. 
This is because there were countless other people who saw things Stuart's way. And because they had made, uh, they had means not just to survive, but to thrive. A product of the oil patch, Stuart was molded by the environment he inhabited, the natural resource he encountered, and the philosophies of corporate and Christian outreach they helped engender. His theology, a call to save souls before Christ's return. His sense of capital, a mandate to make and spend cash quickly. His corporate strategy, an incessant drive for new pools and his politics, a need to protect his access to crude, were exercised with an urgency that reflected his standing in the volatile boom-bust realities of his location. Unlike the Rockefellers, he did not enjoy the luxuries of time and patience or certainty of a future that would play out his way. He did, however, enjoy some dominion over his soil and a proximity to the frontiers of oil wealth that would allow him and his allies to fight back. It would be left up to a subsequent gen generation of independent oilmen to carry this quest forward into the second half of the 20th century. Even as Lyman Stewart passed from the scene, wildcatters like Sunoco's chief executive, J. Howard Pugh, were demonstrating eagerness to shore up Stewart's faith and fuel values and strike out against the Rockefellers and their worldview. In the process, Pugh and his peers would deliver an answer to Fosdick's proverbial question, shall the fundamentalists win? In some ways, yes. And we will turn to uh, the mid-20th century and that part of our story tonight. Thank you.